Good morning. I'm gonna be a lot more um, casual this morning in what I'm sharing with you. I'm gonna just take my time and talk with a few people who arrive on this um, this time. I'm gonna talk about some specific things, and I'm hoping that have a good conversation. I want to talk to you today about the box. Uh, as I'm sharing today, and I'm going to be very, very casual. I'm on a, um, I'm on a road trip right now, so I can't, can't look at you all the time. But um, I want to cover a number of things, I encourage you to share this, and um, um, I didn't let anybody know I was doing this this morning, and I was just in the car, and I was like, you know, I just need to do this right now, because um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've really been on here, and there's been a lot happening, there's been a lot happening in the church, there's been a lot happening in the world, and we as... God's people should be ahead of the curve, not behind it. And many of us are, we're just behind it, we're behind the curve. And um, we don't know what's going on, we're afraid, uh, concerned. Uh, some of us have fears uh, of, 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 what, of what's gonna be left of after, after we're finished this whole thing. But I want to I want to just be blunt with you today. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start by talking about the box. And um, I actually have shared a few things this weekend, pretty bluntly. But I I haven't shared them recorded or online or with anybody else. And so there's some things I want to just kind of help you understand why why I do what I do and 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 what brought it on what what precipitated it, um, why I believe what I believe. And it actually goes all the way back to um, 1982, believe it or not, where uh, I first experienced the Holy Spirit, but I remember hearing my, um, my pastor at that point in time, um, he was, uh, he really passed through the, the Yorba Linda Vineyard. Uh, John Wimber was there, but he was more of somebody who was a spokesperson for the, for the vineyard, and obviously God used him significantly. But his brother-in-law uh, really pastored people. And uh, John would tell me that one day. He said, if I, if I didn't have Bob Fulton, he said, I would never have had a church. And... Um, Bob shared with me during that time, Jesus wants his church back, Ezekiel 34. And in Ezekiel 34, it speaks about the shepherds that clothe themselves, but they don't clothe the sheep. They're, um, and that the sheep are just wandering everywhere, aimlessly. And that God wants his sheep back. God wants his people back. Um, God actually wants to be the one who's shepherding them, leading them. and. And shepherds are intended to be under shepherds, not not lording it over any, any anybody. So that's kind of where this all points all the way back to. It's part of my DNA, it's something that was built in me as a young man. But years later, um, after I'd pastored um, uh, for a number of years, um, I'd been pastoring at this point for almost 20 years and I realized that there were things that I did that were not all that effective things that as much as I did them it didn't seem to change uh, people's lives to the degree that I believe the gospel and the power of God should I'm not saying that people's lives were not touched were not affected were not impacted um, because anytime you bring up the name of Jesus, people's lives are 
impacted and affected. But in my own life, I realized pretty quickly that there wasn't a, a marked difference that when you read through, uh, particularly the book of Acts, and, and you see some of the results that occurred through, uh, through the disciples and, and through uh, the Apostle Paul, you realize there was a significant transforming power that, that occurred in uh, people's lives, so much so that whole regions, whole cities were affected. And, uh, and that was where I was frustrated. Uh, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2004, Graham Cook would give a word, and in that word he said, um, you've asked God to do a prototype church, um, he's going to let you. There was a lot more to the word, but in that word he basically said, um, there will be people who will not understand you, they won't like you. So I've, I've lived under that, that same resolve and understanding for 20 years that people will not understand um, some of what God's called me to do. And the reason is, is because people have been trained to believe a certain way. Uh, we've been raised a certain way. And um, I shared this weekend, I said, you know, when the Lord sent us from North Carolina back to South Carolina, uh, he sent us to see something that would happen. He didn't send me to go plant anything. People think, oh, you planted this. It's like, no. He said, go back and see what I will do. That was the whole reason, the whole premise for even the walk of faith that God has called Karen and I to, where we trust God. He gets to know our needs. Nobody else does. Uh, we do not function uh, like a business. Um, uh, we're, we, we don't want to be a business. We are... We are children of the Most High God. And yet, church has become a business. I shared a, a word yesterday from uh, a dear friend who uh, at this point did not want uh, his name attached to it. But what an amazing word that he carried. Uh, very much along the heart of what God has given to me. Because... The church that we have come to believe in and receive has been, in many respects, various kinds of boxes, theological boxes, um, style boxes, um, all kinds of different kinds of boxes. And these boxes have, um, they, they, they actually, um, they form they form what your worship will be like they form what your gatherings will be like they form what your um, how you um, how you do what you do they, they, they forge all kinds of things around you where you have to kind of make it fit um, into your world and when God moved us from North Carolina down back to South Carolina, this is back in 2003, um, we were in a place where it was really awkward. I had grown up in the church. I, I, I got saved when I was five years old. And and so I'd grown up in the church. I went to church. I love church. I love I love God. I love Jesus. I you know, I, I had a I had a little plastic guitar by the time I was probably five or six, and uh, I'd sing to Jesus. I, I love Jesus, um, and, and that has never stopped. That 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 is not a questionable thing. And in my life, I I became a part of at that juncture what would have been considered one of the most radical um, uh, releases of the Holy Spirit on the earth in the early 80s, um, which was the vineyard. 
and at that point in time, boy, that was seriously the cutting edge. Um, but the Lord would take me further, and I remember the day that he said, you know, I'm still moving. And he said, uh, do you want to get stuck there? And I was like, what do you mean? He said, Danny, he said, I, I, I love what I did there, and I love what I'm doing um, through people's lives there. But I'm still, I'm still moving. I'm, I have not stopped moving. I'm, I'm, I'm still doing fresh things on the earth. And so when that began happening and God began shifting things, and I, I, I went there during a time of crisis of my life. I, um, I was on a sabbatical during this crisis. And, and it was during that crisis that I, I sat down in the church that I planted and I, I almost threw up because I realized it looked like me. It didn't look like Jesus. And there would be things the Lord would tell me about what he wanted to see in his church that were not occurring. And, and I didn't even know how to express that and, and would not express it for a long time. But it was there. It was real. And, and so I, I, I reached this point of frustration. Later on, the Lord would tell me it was a holy frustration. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, what, it's what actually precipitates the greatest moves of God on the earth. Um, it, is, it is what happened to uh, Martin Luther, uh, that frustration uh, where he would nail his 92 theses to the door of the Wittenberg door, to the Wittenberg door. Um, it, 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 it is those things that, that uh, Francis of Assisi um, would, through holy frustration, realize what the church is doing is not what Jesus was doing. I need to do things differently. And so this holy frustration has worked throughout history. It is, it is not, it, it's not something new, but it's there. And some get it and some don't. And it's obvious that most don't. Most don't. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because you can look at, at any previous move that where this has happened or occurred, and you, re you begin recognizing, wow, they were like standing alone. They were revolutionaries. They were, they were shifting uh, the whole culture, trying to, and it was hard. They went through resistance. Many of them were persecuted. Some of them were martyred as a result of this uh, for, for doing godly things. They, they were cut off. And so uh, through this process, the Lord was showing me some things. And, and when he began uh, showing me the things with um, what he was doing uh, with Mountain of Worship with Mo, um, I remember at our first conference in 2005, October 2005, there were things that he'd already told me. He, the, the worship team had said, how long should we go? And I said, you'll know. I trust the Holy Spirit in you. Um, when people were giving words, the Lord rebuked me for trying to clarify a word and, and make sure that uh, I was uh, processing that, that word through somebody who knew how to hear from God. And the Lord said, what are you doing? And I said, Lord, I'm trying to see if this word is from you or not. And he said, I know if it's from me. And he said, um, the church, he, he said, give him the mic. And he said, the church will never learn discernment if uh, everything is pruned through a few. And so I've seen that for, for decades now. I've seen that much of the church and what is seen as the church has been pruned by very few people. Uh, these leaders, these whether they're denominational leaders, whether they're uh, movement leaders, um, and, and there's certain people that we look to, that we go to, who are the leaders. And so as a result, we, we become accustomed to uh, the box that we're affiliated with. When we moved back there, um, I had many friends, many friends who um, were pastors in, in Columbia, South Carolina, where, where we began. And many of them asked me, they said, well, why don't you just come here while, while you're watching this thing emerge? And, uh, and the Lord very specifically said, you can't do that. I said, why? He said, he said because they will think they own you and you'll never accomplish what it is that I have for you to do. 
and um, and I didn't really fully understand it. And I was like, Lord, what what should I do? And we we would end up going to the beach on Sundays because we didn't meet on a Sunday. And I mean, I th there were some who really judged us. Some who really were like, Don't you know you should be in church? Don't you know you should be in church? Just a few weeks ago, I was. <laughs> This is after doing this now for 20 years, having our house filled with people every week um, on a Tuesday, uh, not on a not on a Sunday. And somebody came to me and he said, "Well, don't don't you think you should be going to church?" I, I laughed. I was like, "You really don't understand me, do you? You really don't understand that that what we're doing, because the reality is we worship we." Um, we, uh, there's teaching, there's there's love, there's community, there's relationship. People are fall, falling in love with Jesus. Um, there is um, uh, people give, people learn to uh, to be become responsible with before the Lord. But yet, what happens? Um, and there, this happens with even many who who show up at my house. Uh, it's. It's something they'll do. Well, this is a ministry. I, I, I like what's going on there. But, you know, I, I have to go to church on a Sunday. It's just not valid unless it's on a Sunday. And it's hilarious. I've been told by pastors, why don't you just start a Sunday meeting? And I'm like, because the Lord hasn't told me to. And, and that's hard for people to understand. It's like, why wouldn't he tell you to? You have so many people, people who, who are a part of this, but... And see here, here's the deal. You ready? We in the church have become accustomed to owning people. And so local congregations own their own the tithe of the people who go there. And I look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is broad. And, and it's one of the reasons why unity is so difficult. Because there is a, a line of demarcation like, mm, these are my people, and those are your people. And I won't steal yours, but you don't steal mine. Who ever thought that in the body of Christ we would worry about stealing each other? I remember hearing one of the most phenomenal pastors during that season in Denver, Colorado, saying, you know, we have pastors that are really angry because some of their people come here. And he said, he said, I don't want them to come here, but the reality is you're not feeding them. He said, you know, they're, they're crawling under the door. They're begging to come here because they just want to be fed. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of what is happening in the body of Christ is that um, shepherds are to feed. They're just supposed to lead people to where, where they can eat, but they don't own anybody. Jesus is the chief, the chief shepherd. He is the one we're following. He's my pastor. He's my apostle. He's my prophet. He's my high king of glory. Jesus is. Not, not individuals. I've had people who have been fathers in my life. They've spoken into my life. But I don't own, they don't own me and I don't owe them. It's Jesus I owe for my salvation. He's the only one who shed his blood for me. And and so we, we, we've done this thing, and so people feel this need. Well, when we began, we, you know, we're going to the beach, and, and I have to be really honest, I felt guilty for like three months. I felt like every Sunday we were at the beach, I was like, man, I, I just feel so guilty. It's like, Lord, what what is this? And the Lord would tell me, he said, Danny, it's a religious spirit you have. I said, I do? He said, yeah. He said, you, you think that relationship with me has to be forged within four walls. And, and you know, of course, I'm quoting to the Lord. Well, it says, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. And he said, but who said that that need to be then in that place? And I went, wow. And the Lord began developing in me a mentality for community. You know, in uh, 1 John 1, 9, we, we read about that. 
Uh, we, we know that verse, you know, if I confess, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we, we're constantly, you know, we confess our sins to God, to God. But the context of that passage is not confessing your sins to God. And so we, we probably have many pastors out there that have gone through some things in their life and they're afraid. They're very afraid. They're afraid because they're like, well, I, I confess to God. And that guy there, he confessed that things to God and he confessed some things and he, he, he's forgiven, right? And um, you have to go to 1 John 1, 7. You have to go there. It's just two verses earlier, but it says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's how it starts. It, it begins with relationship. It begins with transparency and honesty with each other. That when we're honest and transparent with each other, our sins are confessed, are confessed, and guess what? And they are forgiven. This is before you ever go to Jesus. Jesus already forgave you. The issue of, of unforgiveness really has to do with our relationship with each other. When you carry unforgiveness, you carry, or you carry, um, a sin in your life, you're hiding, you're hiding. Never forget that, that when we hide, it is a deceptive thing. Much of what has gone on in the body of Christ right now, it, it's, it's not the sins that have been committed. And I know a lot of people are really, really focused on the sins that have been committed, which are heinous, they're horrible. But in fact, when Peter called out Ananias and Sapphira, it was not because of the sin, it was because of the deception. It was because of the lie. And they died from the lie, not from the sin. And so it's very important to understand that, that God and the community of believers that God has for us is, is, is born in, in a transparent place where we learn to become honest with each other and absolutely we don't judge each other. Judge not lest ye be judged. That's, that's Bible too. And so the true, and with the measure you use, it'll be used against you. So you don't want to judge. You, you just, you want to forgive. You want to release people. That's very important. But it is not in the context of God, forgive me. It's in the context of, hey bro, this was an issue I've had and I, I sinned. And I need, I need, I need Jesus to cover this. And in that forgiving place, a person is covered. Unbelievable. So, in the box, mm, the box has a hierarchy. There's certain people who, you know, and 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 don't say it doesn't have a hierarchy. At the end of the day, you go, who's who's the one where the buck stops? Who's the one where you say, well, at the end of the day, they're the ones who pay the bills. They're the ones who can say yes or no. And, and that's how the box has been formed. It's been formulated, it's been forged, and it is, it's a box. And there's a hierarchy in the box. And many times, leaders in particular are very aloof, very aloof. They don't relate to to the cattle, to the little sheep, they they have their their guards around them. They have their their people around them. They don't. They are not. Um, they're not like Jesus was, who was accessible to anybody if you could get there. That's all. You just had to get there. And so, as a result, we we formed this thing and. I, I felt guilty. I was like, God, I, I, I need to go to church, man. I need, I need to go to church. And, and, um, and he said, you've got a religious spirit. I learned to break that. And later on, when I was doing conferences, and sometimes they go into a Sunday, I recognized, my gosh, this thing doesn't affect me. People would say to me, they say, your Sunday meetings are not like any Sunday meetings I've ever done when I've done conferences and things. They go, there's a freedom, there's a release. It's like... Yeah, because I broke that thing. I, I, I will not let the spirit of religion 
affect me. I don't go to church because I have to go to church. And um, that's the box. And I remember a number of years ago, somebody bringing up the whole thing about a box. They said, we're a church that out of the box. And um, and I, I went to the Lord and said, Lord, what, what do you think of that? What do you think of the box? And he said, I, I, I've never, never contemplated, never even considered a box. My church is not a box. My church is a people. And and they are they are one in me, not under people. And um and so that that's one facet that I, I really wanted to share with you today. But there's there's a, there's something else I I also want to bring up to you because I, I'm I'm very cognizant of the fact that there's some people who God has made a call in your life. And he may have made that call in your life 20, 30 years ago. And a few years ago, I remember I, I shared a message. Uh, you can go find it. Uh, there's a part one and a part two of um, uh, stop building your casket. Because uh, some people do that. They they reach a certain age. Uh, they actually reach my age. And they they retire. And, and in their retirement, they... Um, they begin calculating out how they're going to spend the end of their days. For the most part, they, they're going to do a lot of trips and uh, vacate, vacation, and, and then they're going to die. That's building your casket. Um, I've shared frequently recently you know, that God doesn't give us diagnosis. Go find it in the Bible. Go find a diagnosis that God God made, that God made, Jesus made. And one of the things you'll find out is that God doesn't diagnose. He gives destiny. And diagnosis will kill you. Destiny will cause you to live. Because you recognize, I have a future and a hope with Jesus. And so you've got to remember that part. You've got to remember that that you must live according to destiny. Um, that you know, though outwardly um, this frame, you know, this tent is wearing away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And we have to learn to live by the inward renewal. That is the fresh stuff. That is the fresh stuff from God. That is the manna. That is the, 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 the fresh bread that God is giving you. Is this, this daily walking with Him. And that is where your destiny is found. It's not found in... Um, in your diagnosis and some people just live in diagnosis they live in this and they live in failure and they feel like I, I you know I'm too old now I can't I can't do what God asked me to do when I was a teenager and, and uh, or as, as in my 20s and, and so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of dial back and figure out how to make the best of my life and there are so many I don't know how many but there's so many in the body of Christ that have reached this place and man, you got, you got great 401ks. You you got everything all worked out for you. You got it all worked. But the one thing you don't have, and this is a frustration inside of you, is you recognize very clearly when I say this, you're not doing what the Lord told you to do. You're not fulfilling what God called you to do. And God has a call in your life for you to accomplish, for you to fulfill. And um. The other day, the Lord took me to um, 1 Kings 19, and uh, truthfully, when He took me there, I it, it wasn't something that I really wanted uh, because it was it was a, it, I knew that it could come across to some people as very um, in your face correction rebuke. Um, it could, and it did. But in that in in the word. It's, it's where you read about Elijah. And Elijah is depressed. He's despondent. And it's um, and he runs. And he goes to this mountain far away. And when he's there, the Lord asks him a question. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Or Elijah, what are you doing here? And, um, and, and Elijah would explain to him. Well, I, I've gone through this, and I've gone through this, and I've gone through this, I've gone through this. I'm the only one left. I'm, and, and he just, he, he, he had a pity party. 
Like you don't understand all the things that have come against my body. You don't think I understand all the things that have come against my spirit. You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't see the things you you don't care about me, God. I mean, basically that's what he's saying to God. I'm, I'm doing all this for you, and and you are not stepping up to the plate, God. And I've heard people get there. I've heard people in their frustration and aggravation reach a place just like that. And it's very, very hard for for people to stop. Once you begin a pity party, it's really hard for you to quit. It's really hard. Whether it's a physical thing, spiritual thing, emotional thing, family thing, and you begin the pity party and then you're like, you know, God has to do something, I can't do anything. And you lose sight, you lose sight of what God has called you to. You lose sight of it. Well, you can't lose sight of it. And, and what happens is God approaches him, says, what are you doing here? Now there's two things with that question. Number one, you're in the wrong place. This is a Jonah kind of a, a like, dude, God sent you to Nineveh and you went, where? What are you thinking? This was a direct, a direct, you, you are going, you're, you're listening to yourself now. You're listening to, you know, the, the, the columns where you go, well, this is easier than this side. So let's go here. That's, that's what's moving you now. You're, you're led by that kind of a spirit. That, that's not a spirit. That's, that's like witchcraft stuff man that's not cool it's like well this is smarter it's like no it's not smarter it's never smarter to not hear God never and so as a result what happens is we we reach this place where we we're just like you know we're trying to make these wise decisions without without consulting with God or better yet God already told us where to be and we just want to move we want to shift we want to do something different we don't like we don't like what God has done in putting us where he has put us. And so we get despondent, we move, and we say, God, you don't understand. I'm going through all this and you left me here. So that's the one question. And we go to our Tarshish, if you will, where Nineveh, where Jonah went, rather than going to Nineveh. But there's another aspect to that question. And that other aspect is this, what are you doing? What are you doing? Is, is, is there any part of the promises of God that you're fulfilling? You know, years ago, people began asking me, they said, how did you start? I, I began. What do you mean you began? I began. I, I knew God had called me to travel the earth. I knew he, he called me to share his, share his kingdom around the world. I knew he called me to go to, to places I'd never been. And, 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 and to, to, to press in with the gospel. I knew that's what he called me to do, but I wasn't doing it. I was just pastoring a church here in the United States. And there came a day where I said, Lord, if you come on me again, I will go, I will do. I, I, will, I will take it on, my, on myself. I will, I will pay my own way. I will do it, Lord. I will do what you asked me to do. That was the day that everything began. A few months later, Literally, one of my spiritual dads said to me, he said, wow, what happened? All of a sudden, you're just going everywhere. I said, yeah, I, I, I realized that part, part of following God is not waiting for the open door, but in fact that he said, you are, you are a divine appointment. You are a divine, go, go, I've called you. You know, there's no commission that says wait for the open door. The commission says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the, the commission is go. The commission, the commission is not wait. The commission is not pray about it. The commission is go. And so that began happening in my life. And, and, and so the question is, what are you doing here? You're in the wrong place. But the question is also, what are you doing? If you're not doing anything, how on earth can you ever expect to entertain going into what God has called you to give, uh, to, that God has told you he would give you. How can you even begin? You can't, you have to begin. It is a faithful daily giving yourself to Jesus, not just in prayer, not just in reading the word, but in actually activity, reaching people, touching people. He's called you to be a fisher of men. So you've got to fish for men.
Well, Elijah goes through this, and and um, and then, you know, here 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 comes the uh, the wind, the hurricane, the tornado. And 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 we have many many people in this nation have have, have looked to um, these catastrophes, these crazy catastrophes that happen, and they've said, "See, this is God's judgment. This is God." God doing this, and uh, uh, and because we because we're disobedient. Very interesting thing that happens in this whole scenario. There's wind, there's fire, and there's an earthquake. And in each of those instances, each it says God was not in them. He wasn't in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. God's in something else. God's in obedience. God is in obedience. Did you, did you hear me? God is, a, you know, when, 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 when that whisper comes, when it's the voice of the Lord speaking to Elijah, he covers himself. The same thing that happened when the Pharisees heard Stephen speaking. They covered their heads. The same exact phrase. They covered themselves because they really didn't want to hear the truth. And a lot of people have covered their ears. They don't really want to hear truth. They don't want to hear ah, 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 ah. They just don't want to hear truth anymore. They're, they're like, God could speak anything. Ah, ah, I don't want to hear it. They are waiting. They want selective obedience. They want to listen to what they want to listen to. And God speaks. And he says, I want you to first, first, listen, first. I want you to first go straight away to the desert of Damascus. I mean, that's like directional. Go that way. Go directionally towards the desert of Damascus and anoint Hazael. And then he said, and after that, anoint Jehu. And after that, anoint Elisha. After that, after that, Elijah goes and he selectively hears, I can resign. I can resign if I just get Elisha. I won't have to do any more. I'll be all done. I don't want all this stuff coming at me. I don't like the stress of it. I don't really want to be God's prophet on the earth. And he goes and he gets Elisha. And he, Elisha, he's, he communicates with Elisha that he's to follow him and become his replacement. And Elisha said, well, first, can I go back to my family and say goodbye? And you, you again, you have to look at scripture and realize what Jesus said. Well, first, let me do this. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. As for you, follow me. Anyone who's not left family for my sake isn't worthy to follow me. On and on. I mean, Jesus mentions that and you realize that Elijah literally gives him that exact, that exact phrase. And I don't care what you do. Do whatever you want to do. And he's not teaching him obedience. He's teaching him whatever, say la vie. You know, there's so many people that have a say la vie response to, to what God has called them to. And as a result, they are languishing. They are wondering, God, where are you? Why don't you come help me? And he said, you didn't do what I told you to do. Incidentally, Elijah would end his days outside of the promised land. Only two servants ended their days. In fact, even Joseph had his bones brought back to the promised land because there's something of the anointing of God on you in your promised land. Elisha's bones would actually raise a man from the dead. He's buried in the promised land in a cave. But Elijah's, he had to leave the promised land. He was outside. 
along with Moses, who was outside, who could not enter. Both of them was for disobedience. Disobedience is absolutely the most significant thing that you can do when God has called you. It is, it is what will cause you to miss out on some of the greatest blessings that God has for you. God has intended for major blessings, major blessings on your life. He had intended for Elijah to release Hazael and Jehu, the two men who would take out the enemies of God. Jehu would take down Jezebel. That literally God had that lined up for Elijah, but he missed it because he was walking in disobedience. There have been things in my life where God has put people in front of my life and it's just the simplicity of obedience. Sometimes it's just a random thing you don't even understand, but you randomly obey. You just randomly obey. You just say, sure, I'll pray for you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll support you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll release the kingdom to you. Sure, sure. Just those little things and you have no idea the impact that it will have and I can tell you that I know of at least three international ministries, some which are literally reaching hundreds of thousands, others that have trained in the, in the um, 70 to 100,000 range, people in ministry, um, where the Lord just said, do this little thing. And when I did it, it didn't look like anything. The reality is, is that God wants you to do the little things because the little things are what become the big things because it's always the mustard seed of faith. It's always the little things, the little seed that will produce the greatest harvest. I want to encourage everyone today, as you've been listening to me so faithfully, I can't really comment because I can't really see the screen and I'm driving and that wouldn't be safe. I will look at all your notes later on. But I want you to recognize that we are stepping into a time, you know, this friend um, who shared that word that I posted, I'll be posting another one of his words in a few days as well. Uh, he didn't want his name known. He just did not at this juncture. I think one day you will know who it is. Because to me, it's, it, it's, one of the most profound prophetic words that's been released right now and many are releasing it it's much of it is along the lines of things i've shared with you one of the things as we were just communicating you know the lord showed me that the fire that's coming are not these blazing huge massive fires like what we've seen in the past they're not going to be uh, the torontos the brownsvilles the smithtons the the, the, the massive fires and everyone wants that everybody's going for that everybody's trying to line up all their ducks in a row to be able to get that but that's not where it's headed but rather what's going to happen is it's going to be a, it's going to be a ground fire it's going to be a person to person fire it's going to it's going it, to it, it's going to release something where 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 the ground is going to burn with the heat of god where the presence of god is going to be everywhere and you're going to recognize you can't point to a place and say, well, that that's the fire. You just won't be able to say that's the fire because the fire is everywhere. That is, that is the move of God that God is coming. That will be the greatest awakening. That will be the move of God that God has shown me will occur. He showed me that uh, more than 20 years ago, that the fire that was coming would be a ground fire. It would not, it would not be a big blazing fire. And, um, and so I'm, I'm looking for that, I'm, but, uh, but I, I know that in order to get that, the fire has to be lit inside of you. But the fire has to absolutely come onto you, into you, over you. You have to become on fire for God. That where you lost your way, you need to go back to that place on the path and say, Lord, I lost my way there. I'm gonna share one more story with you about that because some of you don't realize you can go back. 
you're just like, well, I'll just go forward. And the Lord says, no, I want you to correct some of the things that you did. And do you know, we would not be having some of the exposure that we're having in the world if, if just a few people had gone back. If they'd gone back to where they missed it. And they had at that point not missed it. A number of years ago, the Lord um, had me go to a place called Skyatook. Skyatook, Oklahoma. If you're watching, I love you guys. And um, it was a tiny little church. Tiny. And um, and I was there, and we, you know, I was having a good time there. Very good time. And, um, um, but it was small. It, it, it wasn't like the most significant move of God or anything like that. It wasn't, you know, there's no great miracles or anything that I recall happening that weekend. But we had a good time. But on that weekend, there was there was a, a, a prophet. A prophet who the Lord had spoken to. Who told them that he had to come and give me a word. He would end up driving about four hours. And um, what happened is I asked him if he could come on a, on a Monday. And he said, no. He said, um, I need to come on Sunday. And I said, well, I have a morning and an evening meeting on Sunday. Will Monday work better or Saturday? And he said, my father said I must come. On Sunday I said well then if your father said that you better come on Sunday and I remember when he walked in the room the fear of God hit me and this man read my mail read my mail so powerfully I mean down to very specific things that had happened in my life in my body um, in um, relationships I'd had that had just just been uh, broken horribly with your betrayal and everything else he knew the names of the people that were a part of it and he literally read my mail well I had never witnessed anybody who had functioned to this degree in a prophetic anointing and um, and so I, I began calling him once in a while you know what's going on and what do you see? And, and uh, had him out to some meetings. And he would give prophetic words to people. And, and I remember that some of the words came about, but some did not. And um, I didn't really know what to do with that at that point in time. Later on, I would find out what it was that was happening. But um, I get a phone call to come back to Skyatook two years later. And I was like, what? I'm, I'm going back to Skyatook? Lord, there wasn't anything incredible. And then he said to me, and there, 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 well, he didn't say, there was actually this long silence. And I was like, did I lose something in Skyatook, Lord? And he said, Danny, up to Sky took you were listening to my voice. What was wrong with my voice? You had to go listen to a man? You didn't want to hear mine? I could feel, you know, and I could, the depth, there was a depth of hurt. Like I'd hurt Jesus. <laughs> How do you hurt God? You know, but I did. And I realized I had been, I had been going after a man. I'd been going after, after a prophet and not after the Lord. And the Lord was very concerned about that. Very, very concerned about that. And, uh, and so I said, Lord, did I lose something in Skytook? He said, you did. 
you stepped out from under the canopy. I went, oh my God. I went back to Sky Tok. And I was in the same hotel that I was in previously. And they had these out, outside entrances, not, not inside, you know. And I woke up the next morning after I got there and there was smoke in my room, smoke. And I was like, oh my gosh, there must be a fire because there was so much smoke in the room. And I, I, I quickly ran to the door, opened the door, it's clear outside, there's no, there's no fire outside. And I said, Lord, what's this? He said, you're back under the canopy. Don't ever leave it. Don't ever leave it. I never want to lose the canopy. I don't ever want to run after prophets. And, and you know what I found? When people run after prophets, they get wrong words. Because sometimes prophets don't have words. You need to trust a prophet to give a word when a prophet gives a word, but you don't want to run after a prophet to try and get a word that you're not supposed to have. Wow. Listen, some of you have stepped out from the canopy. You've stepped away from what God has called you to do, to be. You have completely put yourself in harm's way because you're not hearing God. You're hearing many other voices. Some of you go to everything that certain people do because that's a voice you want to hear because that, that's the voice you trust. And I just want you to know the Lord wants you to trust Him. God wants you to hear his voice. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They don't follow another shepherd. They follow him. Whether you're fighting with a box, whether you're fighting with where you've been and you're not there, whether you're fighting with disobedience right now, come back to the canopy. I'm going to pray right now. We're just going to invite you just to walk back into this canopy to... For some of you, that may be literally going somewhere that you need to be, like I had to do with Sky Tone. For others of you, it's recalling what it was that God said to you, and, and prayerfully, and hopefully, nobody else has already accomplished what you were supposed to accomplish. But that you will begin where you went wrong. That you will, like Jonah, go, I'm going, I, I gotta go to Nineveh. As much as I don't want to go to Nineveh, I got to go to Nineveh. My anointing, my destiny is in Nineveh. I must go to Nineveh. Some of you, if you'll just go to Nineveh, you'll see whole cities saved. Some of you, if you will just simply turn around and go in a different direction, you will end up where God has called you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now, Lord, by your spirit, I won't close my eyes, but you can. Lord, I'm asking by your spirit that you release your presence, your power all over, Father, your people. Father, I'm asking for canopies to return over people's lives. I'm asking God their obedience. I'm asking God that people will begin to obey. They will start. They will just start. That, Father, where, where they've never started, they will start now. They will say, you know, God told me I'd do this, and I haven't done a thing with it, nothing. I'm waiting for somebody else to begin it for me. And right now, Lord, I'm asking you to give them the boldness to initiate what it is that you've called them to do, whether it be evangelism, whether it be opening their home up, uh, Father, uh, whether it be uh, speaking to uh, people at work, whether it be speaking to people, Father, um, in their own family. I'm asking God for all of that, that the boldness will come, that, that Father, there will not be any, any such disobedient servant like Elijah was, Lord, who literally missed the direction of God and just wanted to get out. 
Father, I'm asking that those who have already stepped into that mode of retiring their lives and and um, in, in a way, Father, where they're retiring from the things that you've called them to do. Father, I'm asking today that they would step back out into what you've called them to do. That, Father, some of them have water to walk on still, Father. Some of them have oceans that will open up in front of them. Some of them, Father, in their, in, in their old years, in their aged years, have the greatest miracles that will ever happen in their lives. Father, I'm asking that they'll step back in. They'll step back in. Lord, I'm asking you raise up an army, young and old. Young and old. Lord, that will touch our nation. I'm asking God for transparency to, to absolutely move into our lives, into all of our lives, the body of Christ, Lord. Father, that the transparency would, would, would obliterate, obliterate, Lord, obliterate the, um, the deceit, the lying, that we would not be a people uh, who, who end up like Ananias and Sapphira taken out. But Lord, we be obedient. And if you say, go to the desert in Damascus, Lord, we're going to the desert in Damascus. If you say, go anoint this person, we're going to go anoint that person. Father, I ask for the release of the Spirit of God over every person that's watching, that your power comes on them. Lord, some people need to be baptized all over again by the Spirit of God, filled with you. They have gone so far from where you wanted them. Baptize them again, Lord. Release to them, Lord, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.